Hey guys, it's Johnny back with another video and today I'll give you a crash course in Kubernetes. In this video, I'm going to break down what exactly Kubernetes is and what it's good for and you can follow along to create your own Kubernetes cluster. I do have some useful tips and tricks at the end of this video, so make sure to stick around for those. The Kubernetes ecosystem is a wide field and way too much to cover every aspect of in this one video. But I hope this video gives you the best overview in Lehman terms and does so in the shortest time possible. We will start with an overview, but if you feel like jumping right into the interactive tutorial, use the chapters of this video to skip ahead. Alright, so simply put, Kubernetes is a software that runs on multiple computers and makes them appear as one. That's useful for applications that outgrow the physical limitations of a single computer. Imagine you build a small web app that has one user and you run it on a single Raspberry Pi from home. That probably works just fine and you can scale it to even a few hundred or maybe even a few thousand users. But what if the app keeps growing? Well, you could add a second Raspberry Pi, deploy the app there too, add a load balancer that splits traffic between the two Raspberry Pis, and now you can serve twice the amount of users. But you would need to reach out to a second IP, set up the second Raspberry Pi correctly again, and deploy your application code a second time. And that's where Kubernetes comes in. It runs on both computers and gives you one unified interface to deploy your app. Based on your configuration, it has the ability to stay small on only one of the Raspberry Pis or add some replicas and expand to the second Raspberry Pi. Now, that's what's called a cluster, so far consisting of two computers, also called nodes. It's easy to add more and more nodes to the cluster, so the new limitation is not one Raspberry Pi, but the sum of all computing resources across the entire cluster. Obviously, for industry use, nobody would take Raspberry Pis to build the cluster, but rather server racks in huge data centers. You probably have seen pictures of those. Each individual machine still has physical limits even though they are way higher. Companies with many users would rely on software like Kubernetes that removes these borders between physical machines. It also comes with the huge benefit of cost efficiency. See, when you're a company and build an app you need to rent server capacity powerful enough to handle peak usage, maybe in the middle of the day. But then at night, the amount of users drops, maybe to half, you still have to pay for those big servers with all these resources. Well, you could run your application in a Kubernetes cluster consisting of smaller, less expensive nodes. Autoscaling, which is offered by all cloud providers, takes care of the rest and smartly adds or removes nodes based on your load. Sure, during the day you'll still pay the maximum as you'll need multiple nodes to handle your requests, but at night it'll automatically scale down to one if that's enough to handle that nightly load. And that saves you money. You would call that a breathing infrastructure. Some of the other benefits include extendability, traffic routing, monitoring, abstraction for developers because they only deal with one unified interface, and much more. Kubernetes is a great way to have scalability built right into your deployment and works best for stateless web apps. It also has the ability to run stateful applications, but that's a topic for another video. Every piece of software inside the cluster runs in containers. That's why Kubernetes is often referred to as container management software. Docker is a popular software used by many Kubernetes clusters to run these containers. In case you haven't seen it yet, I highly recommend watching my video about Docker. I've linked it in this corner up here. Even if the Kubernetes cluster at your job doesn't use Docker as its container runtime, for the sake of this tutorial, we will still work with Docker containers as they are compatible even with other container runtimes. The Kubernetes API is the primary way to configure workloads on your Kubernetes cluster. It consists of a few different resources. Think of it as tools in your toolbox. These resources are defined as YAML or JSON manifest files. Now, to understand how to interact with the Kubernetes API, I think it's best to actually do it. So let's jump into the terminal and you can follow along if you just pause the video to type the commands. The only precondition is to have Docker and the Mac package manager brew installed. I explain how to install it in this video, but chances are that you already have that installed. To check, make sure you can run the brew dash dash help command as well as the docker ps command without any error in your terminal. 
And just so that you don't have to set up multiple Raspberry Pis or rent multiple servers on the cloud, we are going to use a software called Minikube which is going to simulate a Kubernetes cluster on your local machine in the form of a VM. To install it, run brew install minikube. And once that's done, run minikube start. Great, you have a Kubernetes cluster running on your computer right now, even if you don't see it. You can make it visible with the minikube status command. Luckily, we don't have to directly talk to the Kubernetes API and know all parameters and headers, but there is a handy command line tool called kubectl or kubectl. It was automatically installed as a dependency of minikube. Now, the most essential resources on your cluster are what's called pods. Pods are running the actual workloads, which are the containers. When I was new to Kubernetes, it didn't make a whole lot of sense to me that there are pods and containers. Aren't the actual workloads running in containers? And it's true, for simplicity, it's easier to assume one container per pod for beginners. Later on, it actually does make sense that one pod can run multiple containers that are dependent on one another. But for now, let's just say a pod is the logical abstraction for workloads that is defined through a YAML or JSON manifest. We are going to use YAML because it's easier to read and write. So let's actually go ahead and create such a pod. What we have to do for that is write the YAML manifest and apply it against the cluster via a kubectl command. For that, let's start with an empty .yaml file and open it with VS Code. You can do so by typing code workload.yaml. I highly recommend to install the Kubernetes VS Code extension or whatever Kubernetes extension there is for your IDE, as it gives you useful syntax highlighting and code completion on Kubernetes manifest files. You can just install it by searching for Kubernetes in the extensions. Now, this extension allows us to literally just type pod and we get a template for a Kubernetes pod. We can fill out the fields and cycle through with tab. Let's go through this manifest and its fields briefly. Every Kubernetes manifest file starts with an API version and a kind. The Kubernetes API reference linked below will reveal in which API version a certain kind is. Our kind is going to be a pod. And if you Google for the Kubernetes reference right here, and then click on pod right here, then you see that pod is in the V1. API version. Every Kubernetes manifest has a metadata attribute that gives it a mandatory name and other optional fields like labels in this case. Every pod is going to have a spec attribute with all the definitions of how it has to run. For the sake of this tutorial, we are only going to fill out some essentials. The pod spec takes an array of containers. A container should get a name and most importantly, an image it has to run. That can be on Docker Hub or any private container registry. We are going to use the Docker Cloud slash Hello World example as our image. The resource limits are there to tell the API how much resources this pod is allowed to use. And for now, we are okay with the defaults. And then also we want to export a port that is exposed by the binary running inside the container so that our app is accessible. And let's just quickly highlight all these names here and replace it with our own name, Kubernetes Tutorial. And that's already all we need for our pod to run on the cluster. Save this file and open up a terminal. Now, all that's left to do is run kubectl apply f, which stands for file, and specify the file we just created. Now, you can't see much yet, but what you can do to check what's happening, run kubectl describe pod and then the name we gave it earlier. And here you get a whole bunch of information about the pod we just started. This field should eventually show running. It might take a few seconds to get there. Great, the hello world container is now running inside our cluster. So far it is only available cluster internally and the only way to reach it is from within the cluster. 
To see that working, let's copy this cluster internal pod IP address. As you can see here, if I paste this IP into my browser, I don't get any responses. To actually reach the pod, we need to start another pod on the cluster. This time we'll do it on the fly using the kubectl run command for that. Let's specify a curl image available on Docker Hub. These two dashes allow us to run a command inside the container. Let's just curl the IP we just copied. All right, the second pod is now created on the cluster. To actually see the output of the curl command, let's display the logs of the curl pod. And here you go. This is the HTML response of the hello world pod, which knows the host name we just gave it. We did talk about scaling our app through Kubernetes earlier, and that's done via deployments. In Kubernetes, you would actually never create a standalone pod like we just did, but use a deployment resource, which then will spawn pods for you. To create a deployment, let's first delete what we created so far with kubectl delete dash f and then the file. Back in our editor, we can actually modify the pod manifest easily to a deployment. The kind is now a deployment and the API version is now apps slash v1. You can look that up in the Kubernetes reference docs as well. A deployment has its own spec, which has a template. And the template will be exactly what our pod spec was earlier. So we can just move all this old spec in by two tabs. The template will now actually need the metadata with the labels as well. That tells Kubernetes later which pods are managed by this deployment. And to tie the created pods together with the deployment, we give the deployment spec a match label selector for the same label. To do that type selector on this level and then add match labels with the label we used earlier. And now where the scaling comes in is after adding multiple replicas. You can change this number later easy to whatever amount you want. All right, let's go ahead and apply this again with kubectl apply dash f workload.yaml. To see the pods this deployment just spawned, run kubectl get pods and voila, there are the two pods. Now that we know how to easily scale a deployment, let's actually make it available outside the cluster. We will do that by introducing another Kubernetes resource called service, which will act as a load balancer. For that, we'll use the kubectl expose command to expose the deployment we just created and give it the type load balancer. We'll also specify the port on which we expose the app with the dash dash port flag. Now we can actually see our service on the cluster with kubectl get service Kubernetes tutorial. You see that it still says pending in this external IP column, usually on a real Kubernetes cluster offered by a cloud provider like Google Cloud or AWS. The cloud provider would provision a load balancer now that gives your service an IP. Since we're working locally on our machine with a mini cube cluster, we can do the same thing with the mini cube service command. This should automatically open your web browser. If not, just copy and paste this URL. You'll see the demo page of the hello world container coming up. If you look up this host name ending with 6ZZN, K in the list of pods you can get with kubectl get pods, you'll find that it matches one of the pods. So here you see the pod ending with 6ZZNK. To see the load balancer working, let's run this command, which queries our service 10 times and extracts the host name from the XML via a pub command. You'll see that we hit each of the pods roughly half. This won't work in your browser due to browser caching. And there you have it. We just deployed a web app on a Kubernetes cluster, scaled it up and accessed it through a load balancer. Hopefully this makes you ready to scale your own web apps.
All right, so now that you have some idea of how to use Kubernetes, let me give you some tips and tricks. You probably have noticed this info here that shows up in my command line. That's through a tiny but useful tool called QPS1. You can install it via brew install q-ps1. Follow the instructions in the readme link below to add it to the config file of the command line you're using. Similarly useful, especially if you work with multiple clusters at your workplace, I recommend kube context and kubeNS, which you can install via brew install kubectx. You can use it to navigate multiple clusters and namespaces. Namespaces are a logical separation within your cluster. So far, we've only worked on the default namespace, but they are a powerful tool to logically separate workloads into different namespaces and to enforce different permissions. Type kubeNS to see all your namespaces and you can start typing to match with fuzzy search. Hit enter to select a namespace. The selected namespace shows up in kubeps1. And last but not least, I highly want to recommend the free Kubernetes course on Udacity link below. This video only scratches the surface on Kubernetes and the course is a great way to dig deeper. If you have any questions or feedback, leave it in the comments below and I'd super appreciate a like and subscribe. And with that, see you in the next one.